Inflation is everywhere. Seriously, make it stop. Thankfully, Mint Mobile is giving you a much-needed break on your wireless bill. Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just $15 a month. Order today at mintmobile.com slash gam. The, the mop bucket calls her a kid killer. The faucet calls her a kid killer. Just one thing on the mop bucket. She's like cranking the, the handle on like a thing to squeeze out the rag mm-hmm. in the mop. And every time she cranks it, it says kid killer. <laughs> like she's got like a crank operated kid killer machine. Yeah, we shouldn't have given you that one. Sorry, that one's that, that's for something. <laughs> Why don't you switch with Larry's bucket? Yeah, like she does it small. Right. And she, t- she uses Larry's and it's like pedophile. And she's like, sorry, Larry. God damn. <laughs> you deserve to be here, Larry. Fuck. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema, because for all we know, that's what's been making the sun come up this whole time. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath's going to be unable to join us this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? Episode 420, baby! That's right. Yeah! That's right. I'm a blacklight poster right now. <laughs> and I am a blacklight. And also joining <laughs> us today is the host of Be Reasonable, the co-host of Skeptics with a K, the project director for the Good Thinking Society, and one of the organizers behind the very best conference in all of skepticism, QED, which is coming up in just a few short weeks. Check the show notes for more details. Michael Marshall Marsh. Welcome back, sir. Hey guys, good to be here. I am so inexperienced with drugs that I did not realize the reason you were doing this particular film was because it was episode 420. <laughs> until Eli just said that. It, just, it all came together for you, huh? <laughs> I wrote in our calendar, we should do this one high, right? Like, oh, funny high episode. And then I realized it was a marsh week and I was like, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just it really all you're saying is that you because I always do I'm high right like so you you're just saying I should have smoked weed for this episode. I should have smoked weed before yeah. this record yeah was my uh, was my plan or we should have drugged Marsh at the beginning of the record and then just been like Marsh you're being really weird everyone's mad at you yeah so. no, but Marsh it's right we sent you some birthday cookies I don't know if those yeah, arrived there you go. in time yes, but they were exactly. definitely birthday cookies that you have to eat before this episode. And for the newer listeners, I should point out that we actually did exactly that with Eli once at a live show very long ago. So you got to go back and listen to the archives. No, we've heavily hinted here, but we might as well make it official. Marsh, tell us, what will we be breaking down today? Oh, uh, so we watched Wild Weed. She should have said no. <laughs> it is the story of a nightclub dancer who gets pulled into the sleazy, hard drugs world of marijuana. Marijuana, yep. Before, I think turning into an undercover cop to bust the criminal gang. I think that's what happens. Yes. So it, it's basically hash dance meets joint break. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it turns out she should have said no. It's better applied to the casting agent than the weed within the film. <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love the over-the-top propaganda of your driver's ed class, but you wish they'd told you that Parallel parking would land you in the loony bin. <laughs> you will love this movie. Yeah, in case Reefer Madness was too thickly plotted for you. Now, I, I should point out here, too, that the lead actress in this movie, Lila Leeds, was actually busted for marijuana. She was busted like very publicly for possession and use of marijuana, spent 60 days in jail. And this movie was like her way of trying to, you know, rehabilitate her public image after really? that because that was yeah because yeah. that was still a really big deal in 1948 now i should say she was caught along with robert mitchum who went on to like i don't know win oscars and shit like like he yeah. nothing, nothing happened to him but to not Lila have to do yeah, was, he's her fine. career was ruined after this wow yeah so let's start off on that sad note she had to change her name to lucinda no <laughs> okay you can call me old all you want but i'm sending her after you if you start that with my wife now is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at oh yeah i want to go for uh best best chapter titles on youtube <laughs> <laughs> we watched this on youtube it was uh, uploaded by cult cinema classics who had done us the the favor mm-hmm. of titling each segment of the film with their own titles and you know some of the the ones that were not even as impressive as we get to were things like 
boss our friend and uh, she's mafia wife material <laughs> and uh, the ones that are highlights I'll come to in the notes because mm-hmm. they were delightful they're they phenomenal. really were yeah. and they even knew how to like let it build and, 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 and deliver on a punchline it was great stuff yeah it's fantastic so I'm going to go with best worst overreaction so <laughs> at one point in this movie the main character's little brother catches her smoking weed and I'm not going to spoil anything now but trust me he overreacts more than you're guessing based on what I've said so far. Yes, he does. That is true. That is yes, absolutely true. He does. <laughs> and I'm going to take the easy one because I always take the easy one. I'm going to go with best worst marijuana smoking method. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I looked this up because I was like, why the fuck are they doing this? And the weird thing is that I guess they were trying to be able to send this movie to more theaters. This was on IMDb in the like fun fact section. So Mm. grain of salt. So they thought that if there was less lady smoking, the movie would be available in more places. I don't know. Uh, We'll we'll get to it when we get to it. So so actually, this is part of the Hayes Code that that governed movies back before they started rating things R and PG and PG-13. And you weren't supposed to show drug use. So what they show instead is people putting their, like, cupping both hands as though there's a joint in there somewhere and puffing on something and then, like, smoke wafts in from off screen because now they haven't actually shown anyone how to do the drug. Oh. Yes, so they're all basically palming the joint every yes. single time. Like they're, they're close up magicians who like to get high in the 40s. That's what this is. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. I, see, I thought they were all just doing some kind of bird call at the same time. Right. Yeah, yeah no, that's certainly look what it looks like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, so I have to obviously smoke a spite bowl before we dive all the way in, but we're going to keep the break brief. And when we come back, we'll dive into all the hazy bullshit that is wild weed. Or she should have said no. <laughs> or the devil's weed. It was actually it was released under all three titles. <laughs> was it really? Wow. Yes. <laughs> I love making audiobooks a part of my fall routine, and I love using my Raycon wireless earbuds to do it. Raycon's everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. With optimized gel tips and a range of sizes for the perfect in-ear fit, these earbuds are so comfortable and they will not budge. Raycons give you 8 hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life. Raycons Everyday Earbuds have over 78,000 five-star reviews and they're priced just right. You get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. My favorite things about the earbuds are the earbud tap functions and the noise isolation modes. In fact, when Raybud sent us a pair to try, they were so good, my wife stole them from me. School's back in session, which means Raycon is having their annual back-to-school sale for a limited time only. Go to buyraycon.com slash gam today to get 20% off site-wide, plus free shipping. That's buyraycon.com slash gam to score 20% off. Buyraycon.com slash gam. All right, everyone. Welcome to the first ever writers meeting for Wild Weed. She should have said no. Bully. Wow, yeah. Now, Johnson, I hear you have an idea for this film. I sure did. It's a tale of intrigue, a real blockbuster, but with a great moral for the kids at home. Excellent idea. What do you think, Benson? I think it's just the ticket, boss. Hmm, I'm not sure. Let's run it past the gals in the office. Say, Betty, what do you think of my treatment for this picture? I think it's the bee's knees, Johnson. It's a real one-two. Uh, what about that Southern girl? What does she think? Yeah, Helen, what do you think? Well, slap my mouth and call me Sally. This is just the hootinest tootinest treatment I ever saw. Say, is Helen's daughter here? You mean the one that lives in Boston? That's the one. What does she think of the picture? Yeah, what do you think, Eileen? It's good. That's all? It's good? Mm Mm-hmm. You sure you don't have a more complex and verbose opinion? Mm -mm. You sure? Because I remember you having a lot to say about this subject. Yeah, I guess we'll just have to ask her twin sister who has all those previous things, but also has a lisp and a stutter. Look, I I know this sketch is just to make me do American accents, Eli. I am not your performing monkey. I'm the editor of the Skeptic magazine, damn it. The sketch was just so you could make him do American accents, right? Oh, totally. Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I figured. I thought Michael Shermer was the editor of Skeptic Magazine. No, he, he's the other one. The, the bad one. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to start off with a title card that thanks all of America's narcs. 
That's where this movie is going to start. <laughs> this movie is so old that the title screen couldn't stay still. It was just right. it was one of those, yes. it's old, it was moving around. Like, I didn't know movie titles could get Parkinson's, but somehow <laughs> this one has. Yeah, it's really sad. It's mm. sad. You hate to see it. They also spell marijuana like it was yelled at them across a football field. <laughs> yeah, the old school, like, Caucasian spelling with the H. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, it's impressive that a title scroll can even have an accent, let alone the <laughs> accent of a rich, elderly, upper middle class aunt. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, mar marijuana. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this, this title scroll keeps going through. It tells us it's going to tell us the story of tea or tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Noah, were those things slang for weed when you were a kid? You have to tell us. It's like I, being a cop. Okay, so I am totally laying that on my weed guy next time. He's like 25 <laughs> years younger than me, so it's funny in the first place. But I, my, my slang never works with him. I was like, so you got that tea? And he'll go, what? And all those the tomatoes. <laughs> Hoping to purchase little tomatoes from you this yeah, time. Come on, man. Also, just one note on the credits here. At one point, it comes up and it says, theremin effects by, and I'm like, color me surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did also have in the credits, a, a, like the ballet performance and the piano solo. Like you've, you've brought me in for some kind of cabaret act. I was excited right. to see how those would fit in. Mm, yeah. I'm still not sure the ballet did. Did the ballet ever fit in? I don't recall a ballet. Mm. Yeah, me neither. So, but then a narrator comes in and he introduces us to L.A. Like the fucking L.A. tourist board just broke into the sound booth, right? <laughs> Los Angeles, not yet completely covered in the set of a post-apocalyptic movie. Oh, yeah, right, right. Look, you can still see the sky. Yeah, but he says, but like every city, L.A. has its back alleys, right? Yes, and it says the darkest shadow in L.A. is marijuana, which is very much a sentiment brought to you by straight white men. If that is the darkest thing in 1950s <laughs> or 1940s LA, right, yes. it's marijuana. I was going to say, this is 1949. The American Nazi Party still existed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so, so eventually we meet Captain Hayes. He is the chief of the narcotics division here in LA, right? He says, you know, every marijuana case tells the same story, a story of tragedy. And I'm like, yeah, you could end up a fucking podcaster. <laughs> 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 Cautionary yeah, tale. His job as the police captain is to um, leaf through folders of paper and then occasionally open them, and, but don't look at them for any more than five seconds before you move to the next one. That's how you solve crimes in 1950s LA. It's very much moving paper across a desk. Well, I think you're leaving out the most important part, Marsh, which is where he periodically picks a joint up out of the can of joints on his desk and then stares angrily at it to get motivation. Oh, yeah, like he's trying to read its mind. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Who sold you? Talk, damn it, talk. <laughs> right, right. You know, I'm your friend, but we've got a cop here who wouldn't be so gentle with a joint like you. <laughs> Are you familiar with the term canoeing, kid? Because we could canoe you real good. So there's also there's this montage of like secret agent marijuana handoff sales. Yes. Right? Mm. And I was I'm tempted to say that's not how it works because I've bought a lot of weed. But then I remembered Eli and my mutual friend, Frankie, who insists on selling you <laughs> weed like this. <laughs> Frankie <laughs> obviously learned to sell weed from wild weed. You should have said no. <laughs> One joint at a time in a silk handkerchief. Honestly, that would be the most practical way I ever received weed from him. Yeah, no, that's true. There's one fantastic handover as well where it's a guy holding a newspaper and then they just sort of shuffle the joint into his hand and then he moves off, but he moves off sideways holding the newspaper. So I just want to see that in wide shot and just see this guy like scuttling off like a crab <laughs> with the joint behind the newspaper, like really strafing subtle, like. away. <laughs> exactly. And I think this is also where the voiceover is saying about how the, this joint is like this harmless looking cigarette, which again is pure 1940s, 1950s America. You know, yeah, right, this looks yes. like a regular health enriching, life giving cigarette <laughs> that you might give, for example, to little Tommy. But it's actually something bad. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, And he says it's a gateway drug to cocaine and heroin. And I wrote, aren't those like cough medicine at this point? Yeah. <laughs> Barely even took that out of the Coca Cola. But also, he's saying like it's a it's a gateway. If you the marijuana is the darkest thing in L.A. because it's a gateway to worse things. Yes, to the darker things. things. Yes. 
So, yeah, but then we meet our weed man, right? And eventually mm -hmm. this settles on this weed man. He's at a soda shop because he sells drugs to kids in high school. And it, the, the narrator even says he'll even sell to these kids in high school. And then we cut to a bunch of 30-year-old kids in high school. 84-year-old senators. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is 1949. And those kids served in the war. And I'm yeah. in the first one. These are yeah. all these kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so Marky, th that's the weed dealer. Marky, the weed dealer, he's sitting at the counter and he says to the cashier, and I'm going to say this to the next cashier, I see, change five pennies for a nickel pop. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> it's the best. So, so he could use the phone, right? Because he needs a nickel for the phone. And the kid comes up to him and he's like, hey, Marky, because he's trying to buy drugs. And he says, never say my name. And I wrote in my notes, yes, it's far less suspicious to just gently touch hands with a stranger without talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. But that isn't a standard that Marky keeps up for anybody else in this movie because every other time anyone tries to get drugs off him, they use his name and he doesn't stop him, which makes me think that Marky just hated this fucking kid. Right. Just this one right. particular guy. He's, oh, yeah, he's a, he's a prick. Don't say my name. You don't get to say it. <laughs> it's Don Ford's great grandpa. So, <laughs> so yeah, so, but they're going to do a drug deal. Marky's going to sell him three joints for $5. That's $20 in today's money. Oh, man. Better times. Am I right, Noah? Better times. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's some crappy looking joints for, for 20 bucks. But yeah, and, and, and you know, the kid's like, I don't know. That's all the money I got. And he's like, I'll take your whole allowance because I'm a heartless drug dealer. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> what a weird take on marijuana dealing to children. And they'll charge him too much. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, but I love the way this exchange works because apparently what happened is Frankie went and put the joints in the coin return in the phone booth, then stepped out of the phone booth, haggled about the prices, and then the kid goes in to get his joints that he's just paid for. I wanted someone else to go use the phone while they were haggling. 100%. Absolutely. That should have happened. Ah, it would have been amazing. So, okay. So then we cut to all of these high school kids marijuana right? Which is mostly just cackling laughter. Yeah, but like psychotic laughter, like super evil laughter. I mean, if this wasn't exactly how I behaved when I was high, I could also join this scene. But <laughs> yeah, I, at least one of you have seen me at laugh like this when I've consumed marijuana. So I get it. I do get it. <laughs> and given my reputation for over laughing and everything on the podcast, I don't know that I can dispute this <laughs> reputation <laughs> of marijuana either. So yeah. But one of the girls goes like, I'm on a great big purple cloud and it sure is purple. And I'm like, okay, that was probably worth 20 bucks for three joints. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they both have purple based like metaphors that they're going through while they're high. And I'm like, okay, so someone told the makers of this movie that marijuana makes you hallucinate purple. Okay, we get it. For sure. Yeah, like a copy of uh, Hendrix Purple Haze fell backwards through a time hole. And then that's that's their only experience. And of that's marijuana. how they used yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Also, they're smoking that specific type of weed that makes you incredibly energetic, lively, and desperate to go out dancing. Yes. It's that, that particular type of weed. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so they, so they head out to dance. They're driving around under the influence of marijuana. I wonder what will happen. Car wreck, <laughs> right? Un underneath the, uh, the, the safe driving uh, billboard. Yes. So they've had an ironic car crash. Amazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, well, so we don't see the car wreck, of course. They drive off, we hear a scream, and then the camera pans up to this billboard that's like, you're probably going to wreck your car if you drive around on weed. So, so we cut to this hospital where one of the girls is coming out of surgery and her mom's there, right? And she's like, oh, well, let me place a comforting hand on her leg now that she's out of surgery, but she doesn't have legs anymore. Bam, bam, bam. Yes, so... Did the doctors not tell the mum we're going to amputate the daughter's <laughs> legs? Because like, I'm really glad that doctors these days have stopped doing that childhood take something away under the sheet memory game, but with patients' limbs, which apparently they did in the 1940s. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they were like, no, this will be funny. Let's surprise her. Let's surprise her. No, give her a good old pat yeah, on the knee. No, yes. <laughs> also, this is where my best best really started to kick in because yes. this scene was titled, Look, Ma, No Legs. Mwah. Yes. <laughs> Yes, marijuana stole her daughter's legs. We get another <laughs> scream from her. And then we cut over to Captain Hayes explaining that the other three kids all died, right? The legless girl was the lucky one. Yeah. yeah and say, so, oh, well, they died in a crash. Why didn't they just make the sensible choice of sticking to the five beers they were legally allowed to be drinking at the time? <laughs> they had to smoke weed as well. <laughs> 
Yeah, but what they know is that they need to take this drug dealer that's selling to the kids down once and for all. Apparently, he sells weed all through L.A., right? Because they're like, yeah, but this guy's not like regular dealers. He deals in the and then he just they list every neighborhood in L.A., Right. Yeah, right. like like this film is doubling as an A to Z of LA. It's like, no, it's fine. Right. We'll get money from the map people if we use if we product placement. <laughs> so he's like, cop one, cop two, you guys need to go undercover and and bust this guy who's selling weed to teenagers. And I'm like, oh my God, we're going full 21 jump street, aren't we? Yeah, we are. But this almost never comes up again, right? No. Certainly one of these cops does not go undercover. And as we'll come to later, their way of doing this, their way of trying to solve this crime is to wait until someone comes in and admits the crime, essentially. Yes, they do right, no yeah. other police work. Yep. Mm -hmm. Their undercover work never comes to anything. So yeah, and then suddenly Cop One takes over as the narrator. <laughs> right? He's he's like, I want to do more of a film noir. And they're like, no, we're already doing a fucking anti I'm the narrator propaganda. now. I'm, I'm the narrator. <laughs> it's me. And it's it's a really small thing, but their boss ends that briefing scene by saying, better get some sleep because we've got work ahead. It's like, boss, it, it's 10 a.m. You've just briefed us on the first case of the day. I don't <laughs> think we need to go home and sleep. But this is maybe what they do. The police, they don't really solve a lot of crimes. Like, for example, right? when my car got stolen, the police closed the case on the same day, saying they'd reopen the case if they found any evidence. And then when the car got found, they didn't consider finding the car as evidence in the theft of the car. That officer, still an officer. So, you know, police don't solve that many crimes. That's <laughs> so all I'm saying. They, Twas ever maybe they do just go. To so. be fair, both these cops and the cops that didn't find your car did an excellent job of not killing black people. So I'm saying they used to do it better <laughs> so and they're doing it better. That is true. Yeah, really. yeah, 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 true. Yeah, yeah. Count your chickens or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, so, and, and by the way, I should say that the exact words he uses are, the captain says, better get some sleep tonight. You may never do that again, which sounds like a fucking death threat. But then <laughs> cop one, the sudden narrator takes over and he's like, the boss was right. Sleep, that was for babies. That's, again, I'm quoting the fucking lines. <laughs> he's like, so I went home and I brushed up on my jive talk. Yep. Yes. And got to work. We will never get to hear his jive talk, by the way, unfortunately. This is that's no nineteen fifties jive talk was mostly just slurs, so they cut No, it probably, through. yeah. Although we do hear a tiny bit because he said, I played a solo in the malt shop, which is uh, my new euphemism for masturbation. So that's I've learned something from this. <laughs> or so was he yeah. uh you know playing a solo in the malt shop? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Marsh, does it look like malt? Because you should go to the doctor right now. You should leave this record. Stand up from your computer. Find the nearest hospital. So, and then, by the way, just as we're going, like, wait, is the cop the narrator now? Then the fucking bartender muscles his way into the narrator's booth for, like, three sentences and then disappears from the film forever. It's me. Yeah. It's me now, damn it. <laughs> it's like a quarter of a scene. It's so weird. It's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in film. Yeah. So, okay. So meanwhile, we cut back to Marky and I guess he's like selling weed to all the dancers at this nightclub. Yeah. yeah. So we get him going into the dressing room and this is where we're going to meet Rita and Anne. Now, Rita is already ruined, right? She's already a dope fiend. But Anne is a good, innocent girl that's just working at the nightclub to send her brother to college. Yeah, her brother, who's a three-legged puppy. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't fuck her. She's got a sad backstory, you know, like a contestant in the final rounds of a reality show. Yeah. That's exactly. what we have going on here. <laughs> yeah. Also, Rita says, Ivan, you know, she's only working here because she wants money. It's like, yeah, you're describing jobs, lady. We're yeah, all, that's we're how all jobs working anyway yeah, because we want money. Right. So, but... Marky falls in love. He wants to corrupt Anne with his marrow one full ways, right? <laughs> so he's like, I want a Mita. If you want a joint from me, then you're going to have, well, a, a stick. They call them sticks in this movie. He says, if you want a stick from me, you have to set up a party and introduce me to Anne. And so she agrees and he delivers the joint by gently kissing her on the forehead and sliding it into her hair. Yes. And I really hope, I really wanted him to do that to the high school student too. And just like, hey, Marky, <laughs> you gotta get a different way to deliver drugs, man. I don't know how to tell you this. This is uh, not worth it. What cracked me up about this is that then Rita has to pull this joint out from behind her ear so you can tell how, the, how she got it or whatever. But it's like, 
it's trapped in there and it takes her a really fucking long time. <laughs> woven into her braids somehow. Right. So she gets the joint out of her ear and then she ropes Anne into a night of fucking drugs and purple clouds or whatever. Right. And it's it's weird the way she does it. She's like, oh, I'm having a party tonight. You should come. And Anne's like, no, thank you. So no, no, I'm, I'm going to have that party at your house. So you have to come because you'll already be at your house. Right, I'm organizing yes. at your place. Yeah. And Anne is like, well, that is that is the rule. OK, yeah, I guess I am coming to the party. Got at me my on house. a technicality. Yeah. So, OK, so we cut to the party. Marky's playing a little piano and everyone else is cackling maniacally again. Right. Yeah. I got to say. It's weird. I know that playing piano was a much more common thing that people did back then, but it's way weird to have the infamous drug dealer playing a, a short jazzy tune yes. Yes. on the piano. Like you got to picture Marky doing piano lessons, being like, I've got, I've got to deal drugs to kids later, but I'm having a real trouble with myself. Oh, I don't reach over. You got to reach with the ring finger and then <laughs> hit it with the seven. OK, thank you, Mrs. Smitherson, who I take lessons from Thursday at 2 p.m. <laughs> Yeah, so he's a, he's over there like that, da, 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 da. and and then and Rita, she's so ruined by the weed that she's making out with two guys at the same time, right? That's what yeah. weed will do to you. Which again, like I know that they're trying to say like, watch out, girls, this is what weed will do to you. But what they're also saying is, so guys, if you want to make out with a chick and not get a lot of resistance, weed is your thing, right? Yep. Yeah, it is. It is doing that. It's absolutely doing that. And also, like Anne is just watching Rita with the two guys on the couch. And I'll remind you, on her couch, she's just sat in a chair watching Rita with two guys on her couch. That's yes. it feels yeah. awkward. Uh, feels uncomfortable. Judgy Marsh. Judgy. And, <laughs> I mean, it, if Anne had said she was into it, totally fine. But as far as Anne's concerned, there's I a think it, I think it's pretty obvious that Anne is into Anne, it. Marsh. She's very you know, clearly into it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> since we're going to have to have this fight on air. <laughs> This is why you never take any of my invites to the smooch parties. <laughs> yeah, I'm not coming to make sure I'm party this year. <laughs> not after last year. <laughs> that's why he's not. It's because we all smooched in front of him for that four hour party. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. All right. No, it all makes sense. So I'll, I'll click it. I wonder why now. he kept suggesting board games. But OK, now it's all coming together. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know Crokinole was your euphemism for that. But it turns out. <laughs> So, yeah, so, but Marky wants to, you know, get Anne high, of course. That's the whole point of the party. But she's too busy being a goody two-shoes to do drugs and have fun, right? So he starts telling her all about all the glories of being high. And she says, and I quote, you make living sound attractive. <laughs> right. Yeah. From, that is a weird line from a character who, as far as we are aware, are not is not suicidal through right. this. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. So she goes to light herself a nice, healthy tobacco cigarette. And Marky says, why don't you try one of mine instead? And this is where the fucking theremin kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted them to turn and there's just a guy playing the theremin. Chris, do you mind, man? It actually sounds really good. Nobody likes it, Chris. <laughs> yeah, Nobody. He's, he's like the heroin dealer. So every dealer has to bring their own instrument. And All right, yeah. Open there <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so she tries to say no but he shoves the joint in her mouth anyway and then right, Rita this is the 50s and no means no had not been invented yet yeah, right, yeah exactly. exactly right yeah and Rita sees this and she's like oh guys let's peer pressure Anne into doing drugs <laughs> right and Anne eventually she gives it she's like well maybe one puff won't hurt me and I'm like ooh famous last words right theremin guys going fucking wild back yeah. then <laughs> He's playing the fucking national anthem. Yeah. So, okay. So she smokes weed in the weird cupped hand way that we were discussing earlier. And Rita explains that she's doing it wrong. She's supposed to smoke it. She demonstrates. Rita demonstrates. So apparently you're supposed to smoke it like you're drinking boba tea through a plastic coffee stir. Yeah. Or, or like you're you're playing the world's smallest orbital, like a tiny, <laughs> tiny little orbital. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> Or exactly. trying to suck the meat out of a crab leg. That's essentially what she's doing. Yeah. yeah. Also, I just want to say this is not a realistic movie at all. If this movie were accurate, she would have a beginner coughing fit for an hour and then spend the rest of the evening asking anybody if there was, quote, anything in that weed. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so, so but we watch her slowly don a, a high smile which was just my reason for being that was amazing and and then she goes my head is so light it's like i'm floating and marky goes that's because all your troubles are gone <laughs> and and now and now she's in she's hooked right mm-hmm 
In fact, so hooked that Marky plants a big old kiss right on her lips and she doesn't even resist because of the marijuana. She should have said no. All right. Well, it looks like Anne is well on her way to corruption. So we're going to pause there. But we'll be back in a minute with even more Wild Weed. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you ever find that just as you're trying to fall asleep, your brain suddenly won't stop talking? Do your thoughts start racing right before bed or at other inopportune moments? It turns out one great way to make those racing thoughts go away is to talk them through. Therapy gives you a place to do that, so you can get out of your negative thought cycles and find some mental and emotional peace. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Get a break from your thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash awful today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash awful. Come on now, and don't be square. Try a puff. Yeah, I promise it's a ride like you never had, babe. Oh, all right. One puff. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Now. Okay. Are you, are you all right? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Do you want anything, Ann? Water! It doesn't seem like the water helps. No, no, it it, it, did not. There. Now, who wants to take advantage of me sexually? I don't think I ever want to have sex again, Ann. Me, Me neither. Oh, no, it's not done. <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action with Anne's brother getting home from college. Now, this is, of course, the night after the big weed party. Mm-hmm. Right. So he walks in and it's all just strewn with drugs and debauchery and whatnot. Now, do you guys think he was four times bigger when he left for college <laughs> and has now lost approximately three humans worth of weight? Why did or- they, Why was he in such a big suit? It's like when I was a kid and I'd accidentally put on my brother's suit. <laughs> he looks- <laughs> so he was in a, a much too big suit, but also his, uh, his suitcase was huge, but clearly incredibly light as well. And I have a theory. I think he was walking home and he, he got into an argument with a wizard who shrunk him by 15%, but left everything around him normal size. So all his clothes were normal size. And he's just 15% smaller. Okay. He looks right. so much like, I'm playing Pikmin 4 right now and I could not get over how much like a Pikmin he looked. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to whistle. I'm going to whistle and see if he'll fight a big snake for me. Yeah, I just right? got to check. Right? Oh, that's what that, I, I assumed you'd misspelled something in your notes when you kept writing Pikmin and I didn't want to ask what it was that you, <laughs> you were, were worried it spelling. was one of your British slurs. No, I get I was it. 90% sure it was <laughs> a slur. Yeah. I was yeah. 90% sure it was a what slur. What is this, Heath at the, at the Glasgow show? No, come right. on. <laughs> So and my favorite thing, too, is when he walks in the room and he looks around and everything's like it's still messy there and there's a guy passed out on the couch. The theremin is still going. <laughs> so we have to assume that the heroin dealer stuck around. Right. He's just still there, you know, just like doing mood. Yeah, I guess. But they've destroyed the house with their you know, several hours of smoking a joint. But by <laughs> destroying the house, it's like they've locked knocked over the lamps and the cushions, almost specifically just the lamps and the <laughs> yes. cushions are knocked over. Yeah. yeah, They knocked over exactly what Mrs. McGullagunny, who lended them their house for this shoot, would allow them to knock yeah, over. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he goes to the dude that's passed out on the couch and he's like, get out of here now. You know, that's uh, or something. And the guy leaves. And then he goes to Anne's room. He looks around and her room is also a mess. Now, I expected, you know, that she'd be in bed with Marky. But she's not. She's just in bed. No. No. The, no. Yeah, the haze yeah. code also forbid men and women in beds together. So, But we do follow around the room to see her leaving like a trail of claws to the bed one by one, like like she was fleeing from a bear to her bed. It's just like yeah. you right. throw a piece of clothing down there, the bear will stop and sniff it and you can get into your bed safely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And the shot is panning in such a way that the narrator might as well come in and go, you guys know what happened. Right. Yeah. Now. Right. Yeah. It, 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 honestly, it feels like it should resolve on a dildo, right? Like, like the end of his <laughs> visual journey. But no, it's just her in bed and he, and he goes and he wakes her up 
and she goes, why didn't you wake me up? <laughs> yes. And he said, like, oh, because I, I wanted you to carry on sleeping. You looked so... And he said, you did. You, like, you, you just got who here. Who are you gaslighting, right now, you movie? Immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Such a weird line. Yes. So, but but she's like, why don't you go make coffee? So he he goes, he leaves, he comes back with coffee on a fucking silver tray or something. <laughs> like under a cloche or something, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And and they start talking about how he doesn't want to go to school anymore because she's working too hard to put him through college and it's just not fair to her, darn it. And he feels like a mooch. And he's going to college to paint. So he's going to be the, the art student who is anti-weed. So like the single art student who is anti-weed, I'm assuming. <laughs> it's just him and Hitler being like, no smoking weed for us. Am I right, Adolf? <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, exactly. Super cool. <laughs> Yeah, and but then she remembers that Marky said something the other day about how she could make a lot of money in a different job, and then it wouldn't be a problem at all to send him to art college, right? Yeah, and, and by remembers, we hear Marky continually saying that over and over again. I thought it's a bit weird of Marky to have left behind like a recording of him saying some of his lines in her bed <laughs> once he left. <laughs> Something to remember me by, totes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So then we cut to, like, I guess Bob is now, I don't know, at Rita's house or Rita's at his house, but he's now confronting Rita about why it was that there was a dude on the couch and everybody keeps talking about Marky, right? Right. And she's like, what's with all the question, kids? And had a little party, that's all. And he's like, well, I'm sure glad I missed that party. And she's like, why do you suck? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and then he just he repeats the conversation he had with Anne about not wanting to mooch off of her. And we're like, didn't the movie is the movie not watching the movie? We already know this. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. But finally, it's just, uh, he goes to leave. And then he's like, wait a minute. One more thing. Who's Marky? And Rita goes, you're a drug dealer. And he goes, what? And she goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and this is also where Rita's saying, no, you don't need to quit because Anne's going to get some more money. She's going to start doing a speciality act at the club, but it's going to be a surprise, a surprise speciality act for her brother. And I thought, this is a speciality act at a nightclub. That's a surprise for her brother. Like, is he going to be the first to get one to like get his beer bottle opened? Is that oh, what's the surprise? <laughs> here? Do you play ping pong there, kid? <laughs> so, this is important. Here's a banana and here's Lizzo. You work oh, it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too soon, Marsh. Too soon. Our hearts are recovering. No, no, it's a get ahead. It's fine. Our oh, it's a the, get ahead. No, it's, it's okay. A, We're okay. It's a get ahead. You're be by then. We're over it now. Yeah. All right. So, so, so then we cut over to to Marky. He's going to see his boss, right? Because drug dealers have bosses, and their bosses have offices. You know, with big mahogany desks. And what? secretaries. <laughs> What's in the drawer of his desk? <laughs> drugs. Dr these are the financial reports. For oh, but the for the drugs, drugs. yes, exactly. <laughs> but the boss is mad at Marky because he's seeing in the news of this this all this stuff about this fatal car crash that these teens had at the beginning of the movie, and he's pretty sure Marky's the one that was selling them weed, right? And that's gonna bring the heat down on him. Exactly. Is this where he says, where Marky says that the boss here, which is Jonathan Trainer, I think is the name of the boss here. Mm -hmm. He says the boss is, it goes through three suits a day. Yes. He says, oh, you're a big fancy guy with your three suits a day. Like, why does he have three suits a day? Like, please just, I want the movie to just stay there for a moment. Like, is he, is he sweating through the suits or is he <laughs> shitting himself and he did change? And does he change at work? And if so, do the staff notice, but then pretend they haven't noticed because they don't want to ask because they know it's going to be a whole thing if they bring it up <laughs> and they just pretend he's still wearing the same suit. Oh, this afternoon suit? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Oh, did someone notice I've changed once again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, such a weird fucking line. Very fancy. But Trainer tells him he's going to have to raise the price for his weed now because he's bringing too much heat. But just then he gets an old timey phone call, right? <laughs> and, and by just then, it is literally punctuating the sentence. It's like, well, I guess I'll buy those drugs for you as long as nothing happens to your supply. Ring, <laughs> ring, ring, <laughs> ring. What could that yes. be? Yeah, apparently his shipment, his next shipment of tea got hijacked by a rival outfit. And Marky says, you know who I think did it? Miller. And we're like, have we met Miller? We haven't. Mm -mm. We have no, no idea who this we is, haven't. why Marky expects it. But 
trainer's like, you're right. That probably was. So he has Miller killed. <laughs> yeah, on his word. Instantly. <laughs> yeah, like, on his word. And also gives him a discount on the drugs off right. the back of that rumor as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's like, well, I'll just have Miller killed and I'll sell you the weed at the regular price again now that you've helped me out. He's like, well, there you go. <laughs> Fuck. I'm glad my appointment was at three and Miller's appointment was at 3.30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so Trainer sends Raymond, now this is, this is his like heavy or whatever, out to have a little chat with Miller, right? Yeah. And then we cut to a newspaper headline about the cops finding Miller's dead body in the ocean. We get it, movie. We get it. Yeah. <laughs> they killed Miller. But the thing is, Butch Miller is apparently such a famous drug dealer. You can use his name in the headline without a descriptor. Because right. it just says, body in river is Butch Miller. And like, if you were the, the, the person buying the newspaper, you'd be like, well, who the fuck Butch Miller? You don't explain <laughs> who Butch Miller is at any point. <laughs> and also just reading the little, the little text underneath, the newspaper also includes the sentence, bullet holes are definite proof that it was murder. Yes. Yes. You've nailed it. Yeah, You've no, absolutely it. nailed it. That will prove that it's murder. I honestly <laughs> almost went with best worst newspapers sliding into frame because if you read everything in these newspapers, you will not be disappointed. Oh yeah, it's great. <laughs> so then we, we montage our way through Anne's escalating marijuana addiction. Yeah, this was labeled high montage in the uh, in the, the, in the, the chapter the, title. In the chapter yeah. title. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, this goes on for three fucking minutes. Yeah, we see tomato cans full of weed. Now I really want to get Noah a tomato can full of joints for Matreon. <laughs> I, I also want you to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, some of the shots in this montage are the previous scene where she'd smoked drugs. So yes. like, even in the montage of her sliding, it's like, and you remember that first time? And like most of the montage is just that one time she smoked drugs. Right, with that and her dancing at the nightclub. Doing yeah. some dancing, yeah. Yeah. But eventually this resolves at another weed party complete with piano. I guess we, I guess that's what parties did before record players got popular. I don't know. But the guy who's playing piano is... What do these people need drugs? Right, yeah, right. <laughs> but the guy is damn near playing chopsticks on the piano. This guy is playing the most annoying possible piano. Yeah, and the thing is, this is such a boring looking party. And, in, and fair play to this piece of anti-drug propaganda. It has managed to make doing weed looks so boring. Right, so yeah, that's really true. Does. That. Yeah, you won't even be able to play piano good. <laughs> yeah, now Marky isn't here. She's He's at a business meeting tonight. Anne walks up to the, the pianist and she goes, wow, that's beautiful. And I'm like, it's it's not, though. It's, it's not. Yeah. All, all three of those notes are great. Have you have you got a fourth one you could, uh, you could bring <laughs> into the mix and we'll, we'll really get this party swinging? I'm working on it. And again, she's continuing to smoke weed like she's trying to make owl noises in the Cub Scouts with her hands <laughs> got or, or like she's a squirrel nibbling at a small invisible nut. Yes, like yeah. she's a bad uncle showing you a cool thing you can do with a blade of grass. Yeah, right. No, this, <laughs> th this is actually where I started looking up and I was like, does the Hays Code forbid? Th it doesn't forbid. It, it discourages you from showing drug use. So that that's, that's why. Yeah. yeah. But then there's a guy at the party who starts to have a bad trip. On the weed, right? Yeah, mm. I wrote, Heath's grandpa is freaking out in the corner. <laughs> he starts yelling, I'm going to die. And this chick comes up and she's like, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, Heath's grandpa. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and they're like, okay, well, what you need, clearly need is more drugs. So they give him more drugs, problem solved. And then the, the pianist asks Anne to fuck off so he can play his masterpiece. <laughs> he actually does start playing chopsticks after I wrote in my notes he might as well be playing chopsticks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know illusions make fun of my piano. Yeah, right. <laughs> but then this pianist who we've never, we've never seen this character before uh, until this point, he starts fantasizing about playing piano at a big concert hall. So for two and a half minutes, we watch this fucking piano player play piano at a big concert hall. Well, this is something for the kids, you see. You want some wholesome <laughs> entertainment with your informational drug film, and why not a concert from, let me check, Doug Mastrioni. <laughs> that sounds like a <laughs> good pianist name. Sure. want a concert from Doug Mastrioni? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's such a long scene. It's so fucking boring. This scene was labeled by the chapter titles Existentialist Meets the Absurdist, apparently. <laughs> yes. And honestly, I, I get it. I do Yeah, get it. exactly. Yep, yep. But yeah, so he plays this whole uh, concerto and then he fucking theremin doodly does his way back to the party to take some bows, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the piano song ends, but I'm going to die guy realizes then that he needs some air. So he goes to the window 
the window won't open, so he just punches his way through a few panes of glass, like you do when you're on the weed. <laughs> but it's even funnier than that because it's one of those things that has like the tiny square panes. Yes. So he's not even breaking through the window. He's just punching holes in the square panes and he's still trapped. He's like, I got it. Oh, no, I'm, st I'm still in. This I didn't, just, that didn't help. My hands <laughs> what do I do a second? Why would I think a second one would help? That's dumb. That was dumb. Yeah, I'm like he's going through like piece by piece of a stained glass window. Can you, I need to get the, the halo on the Jesus <laughs> or, can the, or the face on the Jesus. <laughs> It's like just stabbing at it. All of a sudden, Jesus puts up his hand like the three stooges. <laughs> so, yeah, so they all gather around and laugh at him for being stupid. And then we cut to the, the dressing room where all of the nightclub dancers hang out. Rita and Anne are talking about how high they were during rehearsal today. Right. And you know what they say? Being high famously makes you a worse dancer. Yeah, right. Well, I, I feel like it probably does. I, I don't know. I, 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 I couldn't get worse, so I don't know. But but yeah, Anne says, wow, I was all feet. And I'm like, is that a thing? I don't think. <laughs> oh, I wish it was I feel thing. like that would be good if you were a dancer. Yeah, that'd right. be pretty decent. There's a couple of perverts in our audience that really wish that was true. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, but she's like, I, what, I, what I really need right now is drugs. And this is also where like Rita is like, oh, and by the way, so I probably should have brought this up before, but that guy, uh, Marky, that you're buying your weed from, like he's super duper rapey, very rapey. And she's like, ah, it'll be fine. Right. <laughs> so they go to leave. The boss comes in and says, hey, Rita and I need to talk to you before you leave. So they go in to see the boss. We get the scene of them in his office. And he's been noticing their descent into poor dancing over the last several days and is firing both of them. Yeah. Yes. He says, you lumbered about like two elephants, like statues. Is that, which is it? Because like, elephants right, those elegant, are not. <laughs> but it, that's not the same thing. Like they are, they're not going to be like any, they are moving, which statues clearly aren't. Unless oh, right, it was yeah. like you lumbered about like elephant statues specifically, which is just a really <laughs> weirdly specific thing to accuse someone of being. Also, they start to object and he says, please do not excite me. And I wrote my notes. <laughs> I get it. He's French. Yes. <laughs> Oh, he says as well, I shall be brief, but his, his accent is so thick that it sounds like he's saying, I shall be brave. <laughs> and I thought like he's been trying to be like he dislikes confrontation, but he decided to like brave it this time. Yeah, he's like patting right. himself on the back. Like, come on, you, you did it. Well done. Well done. You, you made it through it. So Rita's like, ah, fuck, you take this job and shove it. And she leaves and hangs back. And she's like, I actually would rather not be fired. And he's like, tough, you're fired. And she's like, well, then why did we even include this addition to the scene? Well, I, I think this is even weirder because she's like, look, I'd, I'd rather not be fine because I, I need the money for the, the brother. I've got this kind of sob story thing. And he says, yeah, I, I know you've got a sob story. I feel bad for you. And she says, I don't want your sympathy. It's like, then why did you give him your sob story? Right. Like, the only purpose <laughs> of the sob story is to get sympathy. Was she thinking that maybe there was a chance she could just be like, don't though? And he'd be like, all right, very well. Yeah, I didn't think about it like that. Yeah. Maybe she knew he's very conflict diverse and she, she just kind of like faced him down. He'd be like, okay, I'm not so brave. I'm not so brave. <laughs> Look, you've been very brave, but you're not allowed to fire me. Okay, fine. You have a job yeah, again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he's like, I do feel sorry for you for being a weed head, but I still have to fire you. So, so she leaves. She goes outside where Marky is waiting to pick her up. Right. And, and he's like, well, you're off early today. She's like, I'm off early every day. I'm fired. And he's like, well, now maybe you can be a professional weed head. And, and she's like, oh, is that a fucking thing? I feel like if that was a thing, Noah would have been on that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> she says, like, I lost one of a girl's best friends, a job. It's like, that's not an expression of all no. of the exes. That, there's diamonds, famously, girl's best friend. There are other things you could probably say, but job is not what anybody would fill the X in there. No, Ronald Reagan sneaking into the writer's room. Hey, maybe you all um, say that a job is a girl's best friend. I'm really fucking up the economy in a couple of years. <laughs> I could use you guys as help. <laughs> so now, so we cut back to uh, another piano and weed party, but this time she's there in a professional capacity. Her job is to dress like a goth flapper and, you know, give everybody the hard sell on the joints, right? Yeah. Yes, she's she's absolutely joined the Adams family, yes. <laughs> and Marky, 
stops her like a fucking idiot because Marky doesn't know fucking shit about marijuana sales. The thing marijuana lovers more than anything in the world, second only to a blacklight poster and a cartoon mushroom who is also stoned for some reason, is when someone <laughs> talks to you about your weed to tell you about why it is more than just normal weed that you're supposed to smoke and get high. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Love that shit. No, she's killing it. She's like, step right up and let me tell you all. And he's like, fuck you, just sell them to joints and shut up. Yeah, we've all got like carnal barker for marijuana in here. That's exactly yes. what she's doing. Yeah, she's really going for it. <laughs> yes, exactly. And he's just playing piano at the same time as well. And is this this thing that you, that I'm sure you've told me about where like your dealer asks you to smoke at his place while he plays you like some of the music that he wrote, but like you don't want to get on his bad side, so you do it, but it's like it's super boring. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a lot like that, yeah. Correct, it is a lot <laughs> like that. <laughs> but just as she's selling these drugs and telling everybody how great they are, her little brother comes in unbeknownst to her and catches the end of her weed sales pitch. Right, where she's putting the money away as well. Because she, she's like, $1 for Marky and $1 for me. It's like, wow, she got straight into a 50-50 pay deal. Like, fair play to her, you know, bust the gender pay gap. Fuck yeah. Although, in, in fairness, <laughs> paying women fairly is probably also one of the evils this film is here to warn about. <laughs> yeah, it goes paying women fairly, cocaine, heroin, marijuana. Yeah, right, yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so and she, this is I, I love this line again. She says, "Dig into your pocket for the big, beautiful green stuff called money." And I'm like, "Yeah, see, you just give it, a, <laughs> give it some effort. It doesn't have to make sense. Just, just try, uh, let me know you're trying. Damn it, exactly. <laughs> Everyone loves a little razzle dazzle in their weed sales. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so but Bob comes in and he's like, "Sis, I'm so disappointed." He knocks her joints to the ground, which is very rude. Right. It's all of us. Well, sorry. All the stoners in our podcast have a, okay, Bob, don't take it out on the weed. Okay. Yeah. Man, we're, we're not ruining weed here. <laughs> you want to hit your sister, hit your sister. Oh, Jesus. I don't have that in my Jesus. notes. Let me be clear here. <laughs> Speak for your own notes. <laughs> but yes. Yeah, so, and Marky's like, hey, Bob, why don't you take this $5 and go fuck off until tomorrow? <laughs> he does. Well, he says, go get a double malted or as Marsh would call it, two cums. <laughs> 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 but he does give him whiskey money and tells him to come back tomorrow. But he lives there. That's his house. So like, yep. does he He wants me to go live in a whiskey overnight and come back in the morning. <laughs> I love that you hear malted and can only think whiskey. How very British of you. So, mm -hmm. so the next morning, Anne's leaving the house. She's in a very smart skirt suit, probably going out to look for a job. She goes to the garage. She opens the garage where she finds... <laughs> That Bob, the little brother, has hung himself in the garage, suicidally ashamed of his sister's weed smoking. I wanted him not to be dead because he's so little and his head's so heavy. He's just like, do you mind helping me down? Oh, it actually it turns out a lot of a lot of the weights on top of the rope. I'm actually just a little uncomfortable. And, and, and so in case it wasn't clear, by the way, this was my best worst overreaction. She gives the great movie scream and everything. And then a newspaper slides into place. Again, just every fucking word on it is amazing. It's superb, yeah. But it says, brother of famous nightclub dancer commits suicide in garage. Honestly, if when you die, the thing they list is your sister's profession. Right. Maybe maybe suicide wasn't the worst choice. Okay. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Also, your sister's <laughs> ex-profession, because she isn't a dancer anymore. Right, yeah. But the subtitle is Robert Lester, brother of attractive nightclub yes! dancer, was found hanged. Uh, so, like, <laughs> I really hope that his tombstone reads, Here lies Robert Lester. His sister was totally fuckable. Like, <laughs> he probably saw her naked once or twice. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> went, went off for a single malt, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that big old head. Use it as a fishbowl. <laughs> And then the narrator shows back up out of nowhere. He reminds us that Captain Hayes was part of the movie. Hey, everybody. Sorry, the cops have been doing something. We All have. The, time. It's the 21 Jump Street kind of a thing. But, what were uh, we I doing? Didn't... We were following Marky. Yeah. We couldn't catch him doing any crimes. Well, so this is actually where they first get, uh, like, get clued into the whole Marky thing, right? Because they're like, oh, you know, a guy committed suicide in the garage of his sister's house that's probably weed related we should probably look into that right no it's it's even worse than that it's hugo the boss from the club heard about bob's suicide he was like bob isn't that Anne's brother 
I know Anne, she was doing drugs. I'm going to go to homicide and say that this is probably, uh, he's probably been killed for some of this. Because then the film says, like, Hugo went to homicide, who passed him along to narcotics. So, like, we do not need to know the details of which police departments he, Hugo called 999, where he spoke for a while with an operator who said, come into the, uh, come into the station. And then he spoke to the desk sergeant for a while. It was quite busy. <laughs> it was like, actually very rude that. when y'all, when all things are considered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He went to the police. So the police's attempts to crack this case have been in order, number one, go home and get some sleep. Number two, <laughs> wait for a kid to die and hope that someone who knew his hot sister comes to tell us about well, the drug she's doing. I feel like you left off brush up on our jive talks. <laughs> <So, laughs> I'm sorry, that's true. There was a lot of jive homework. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they were actually first in jive on their Duolingo apps that week, March, <laughs> if you had checked. And also... I love this moment because we see Hugo down at the boss, the nightclub boss down at the station making an ID on Marky, right? So they hand him all these folders and they're like, you know, which one of these people is is the guy? The first fucking folder that he opens up is Rita. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's fucking <laughs> Rita. Like, he's like, well, it was a man. I already told you it was a man. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I really wanted Hugo to have to like wake one of the cops up from the nap that they've been taking since yeah, that initial right, briefing right. as well. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, but but they figure out that Marky is the bad news. So they start following Marky everywhere he goes. And this is what leads the cops to also start looking into Anne as well. But this is where they say that Marky lived in a fishbowl on the end of a string. I like I don't think you need the string no, if he's in the fishbowl. He's not he's not going nobody ever puts this goldfish on the lead. It's not going <laughs> in. These were the these were the questions I had, Marsh. I had the same question. Thank you. <laughs> <That's> so <laughs> fucking weird. Yeah, so but we watch the cops tail. Marky for a while. And then we watched them like reporting to Captain Hayes a week later, right? They're like, we've been following him for a week. We haven't caught him selling a single drug yet. Yeah. Right. Because all, I guess, because of the clever handoffs that he does. And so they decide to go and see Anne, you know, the person that Hugo came in to say, you should probably see Anne. Her brother just committed suicide. You should see Anne. Anne's the one that I know, the one in the paper, the one whose name is in the paper. Could you go and see her? And they're like, yeah. got it, Marky. You're right, right. We're looking for Marsha's car right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. At this point, I wrote in my notes, they're using so much bullshit 40s slang that I no longer know what the hell anyone is talking about. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and there's a line they say about Marky. They say, we don't know his source of income. It's like, guys, it's drugs. It's, it's, it's drugs. Definitely it's drugs. Drugs. That's why you're following him. Yep, that's the whole thing. So, okay, so then we cut to Rita going out on a date with the two guys that she dates. Well, the two guys are waiting for her, like they're all complaining because she's taking too long because she's a woman, right? Yeah. yeah. Imagine having so little content to your movie that you open with a scene of guys being like, bored. <laughs> yeah, and one guy going, Rita. He calls it Rita. I yeah. don't know why he calls it that. Mm -hmm. Come on, Rita. <laughs> So, yeah, so they're, they're like, we should go see Anne. She's feeling really bad about all the drugs that she's been doing. I figure we should go do drugs with her and, and help <laughs> her feel better about that. Right? So we cut to Anne and she's like, she's on the phone. She's like, Maki, I got the shakes. I really need to see. <laughs> yeah. And I would say that this is a silly thing to say about marijuana, but I once traveled through a Japanese airport with Noah and Lucinda where they weren't allowed to smoke. So I get it. What I'm saying is I get it. <laughs> yeah, well, I was about to ask, like, is weed withdrawal shakes a thing? Then I thought, well, I can't ask Noah because you'd have to have withdrawn from weed, right, which means you've right. gone a little while without smoking. <laughs> so let me let me be super clear. That was because we were both cigarette smokers at the time and couldn't have a cigarette. That's not, it wasn't, it wasn't the weed. I turned around and he was wearing a suit, Marsh. He didn't even bring a suit with him, but 11 hours without weed, he was suddenly wearing a full three-piece suit. <laughs> Somehow his hair was short and everything. It was short, yeah, no, it, it was yeah, in a crew yeah. cut. <laughs> so, so we cut to the cops. They're staking out Marky. And when Raymond, that is trainer, his boss is heavy, right? The henchman mm. shows up to like, take a little ride with him to go see the boss, right? Yeah, and the cop's tire pops, so he loses him, and I wrote in my notes, shit, we gotta get a second policeman. Yeah, <laughs> right? They have a second. What is the other cop doing? We never saw him. Did he die? Did that nap actor time. quit? He's brushing up on his goddamn jive talk. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting so good. He is so good. <laughs> so, but, but then, the, because, the, because the tire's popped, he has to go to like a payphone and yes. call the police station for a lift. Like his, his mom getting him to pick him up from the party early. <laughs> Why did they include that scene? We would have figured out that he didn't just die there on the side of the road. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, they felt the need to keep that in the movie. Okay. So then Marky goes to see Mr. Trainer, his boss, and the boss is going to send him to Arizona to pick up the weed. Now, possibly my favorite moment in the entire fucking movie is when he explains, the boss explains to Marky how the pickup is going to go. He says, you're going to drive out to Arizona. You're going to stop at a mechanic near, you know, fucking blah, blah town. And when you do, tell them you need gas and a new tire. They'll know what to do. <laughs> I feel like a bunch of people accidentally get free weed. I think that would happen. <laughs> How many times do they start loading tomato cans and a guy's like, what are you doing? And they're like, nothing, nothing. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Thought you were someone else. Also, the thing to bear in mind is in the previous t scene that we've seen this boss, he's complaining that his shipment has gone missing. Yes. And he kills one of his employees over it. Like, how many employees has he killed because his code is this shit? Right. They're just giving his shipments away left, right and center. Because the code might as well be, do you have change for a 20? And the answer might as well be, sure do. Yeah. And also, <laughs> by the way, he doesn't tell him the name of the mechanic shop. We just know it's near this city. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh there's a brilliant bit as well where Marky is saying to Trainer are you going to kill me and Trainer says are you worried it's like well yeah if you're going to kill me like, if you're not going to kill me then <laughs> it very no. much depends on the answer <laughs> to this question <laughs> exactly if your answer is yes then yeah <laughs> <laughs> so okay so then the, the cops go to check out Anne they go to Anne's house and damn it if there's not a weed party going on there at just that moment this is such a big house like she was affording a house this size on a club dancer's wage. Like maybe I should be a club dancer slash weed dealer. This well, is a massive house. Maybe well, you first should be all, looking for a house in 1949. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, first of all, it's 1949. Second of all, you, Marsh, should absolutely be a club dancer slash weed dealer. Well, you should be yeah, amazing no, that's true. Yeah, at it. Yeah, really. <laughs> I've got the legs for it. I've got, the, got, I've the, got the gams. And now you've got the time. You have yeah. the extra time. It's going great. <laughs> So, yeah, so the, the door buzzes and she's like, well, that must be Marky. And she opens the door and damn it, if it's not actually the cops and they barge in the second she opens the door, which they're not allowed to do. She tries to run for like half a second. She's like, you'll never take me alive. Never mind. I'm wearing heels. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so the, they, they bust her and they bust Rita and they bust the two guys that are there and they ask about Marky. But she, and she's like, I don't know, no, Marky. Yeah, she's like staying tight lipped. Like she's really bought into this lifestyle. Like about a week ago, at most, maybe two weeks ago, she was meant to be like an ingenue who'd never seen a joint before. And now she's Carmela Soprano. <laughs> yes. But she's bought to this <laughs> lifestyle very quick. Very quick. Oh, I believe the chapter title here was She'd Make a Great Mafia Wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, but everybody's under arrest for weed partying now. <laughs> so I guess things are heating up. So we'll, we'll take a break there. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Is it just me or has it been the same minute for a really long time? Am I driving okay? Have you ever really looked at a dollar bill, man? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the devastating conclusion of Wild Weed. Can you believe we've had seven months without an NFL game? Crazy, right? Well, good thing that's over. NFL is here and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is giving you a can't-miss offer for week one. This week, new customers get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you bet just 5 bucks on any NFL game. DraftKings is hooking everyone up with game day greatness. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every single game day this September. Check the app to see what you get. Download now and use code GAM to sign up. New customers can take home $200 in bonus bets instantly, just for betting 5 bucks. That's code GAM only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See dkng.co slash football for eligibility. Terms and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Gladys, send in the new girl. Thanks so much. Well, hey, a friend. I thought I might wilt like the willow waiting on you to call. Yeah, sorry, babe. I've been counting sheep. 
Well, yeah, they all make it over the fence. That's more Bo Peep that I'm worried about. Bo Peep is fine as long as she's got a crook, I hear. Well, what's a crook if... Oh, God, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, this is exhausting. Pardon? I can't, can't we just talk like people? Isn't, isn't this how people talk right now? No, no. There's no way this is how people talk. Not all the time. I'm losing my fucking mind. We're 11 sentences in, and I don't even think we've said hi yet. Okay, fine, fine. What did you want to say? Are you going to Cora's birthday tonight? Well, that depends. Does the dime on a dollar... No, please, tail- just... <sighs> no. Thank you, Jesus. Does anybody want something from my car? I parked in the back. <laughs> Damn it, Marsh is too late for that now. Way too late. Oh, but I practiced you in the break. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to rejoin Anne under the hot lights, getting grilled by Captain Hayes down at the station. Yeah, he's he's like, please sit down. And she's like, it's a free country. I'm allowed to stand, aren't I? And he's like, well, this is going to take a while. And she's like, oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> Why would they include that? It was so fucking weird. She's like, no, I'll stand. And he's like, it's going to be more comfortable if you sit. And she's like, I hadn't thought about it that way. Okay, I'll sit. Yeah, so, and the first question is, hey, why did your brother kill himself? And that (laughs) seems like an unfair question to open with, right? Straight in with a dead brother. Nice move, nice move from the uh, the bad cop of their good cop, bad cop uh, duo there. Yeah, but they explained to her that, like, she might as well roll over on her drug dealer friend, Marky, because, and I quote, Drug dealers aren't even human, Miss Lester. <laughs> yeah. I feel like they are. He says the Markies, the Markies in this world aren't human. It's like, well, yeah, they, that explains Mark Wahlberg's daily routine. Okay, that's starting <laughs> to make some sense. Oh, okay. Actually. All right. So I thought they meant the drug dealers, but Markies specifically. Okay. All right. That's fair. Also, her <laughs> accent changes starting in this scene, right? Yes. We could acknowledge that. Yes. Yes. She suddenly started doing a British person doing an American accent for some reason. <laughs> well, she's going for that kind of femme fatale, mid-Atlantic kind of uh, voice that she hasn't been doing up until now. Right. Yeah, but she's she's hardened. She's she's about to go up the clink. Of course she's going to start developing an accent. Oh, that's true. That's true, yeah. So they're like, you know, he'll take advantage of you. And she's like, I'm immune to being taken advantage of by drug dealers. And they're like, he says... No, you don't understand. See, first they give it to you for free, but then they stop giving you the drugs once you're addicted. And I'm like, well, yeah, but that's what Showtime and Hulu do as well. Like, it's not inherently (laughs) evil to do that. It's just a, (laughs) yeah. I love the guy who tries to convince her. He's like, sure, weed is great. Makes you feel good and it makes food taste better. Significantly less bad for you than alcohol, but. Sorry, what was I talking about? (laughs) I was going to do it. Point there. I. Uh, I had a point. But she's not buying it, so they start to use props. They decide to bring in a girl who's strung out on too much weed, mm-hmm. who apparently they've just had waiting outside the office. Of yeah, the they've, they've kept a drug addict in the office as an interrogation prop. And like, surely, like, we all got excited about what the 24-year-old addict looked like, right? Because they go and get her, her file out of the filing cabinet of every single drug taker in LA, the yes, single filing uh-huh. cabinet mm-hmm. of that. And it's like, here she is at 21. Do you want to see what she looks like at 24? And surely we're all like, yes, please. Show me what you think three years of doing weed <laughs> does to a person. <laughs> and of course, by now she's deep in the grips of psychosis. She, <laughs> she's wearing haunted house makeup now. <laughs> she is that. Which to be fair, is one of the consequences of doing weed. No, like, that, that is, is a real true. risk. Yeah, you no, could that... end up working at a haunted house. <laughs> <laughs> and the great thing is, like, once she's there, they're like, you see, look at her. And then it's like, take another look at the before picture. It's like, she's right there, man. Yeah, like, yes. she's, she's, like, look at the before picture. Now look at her. You see? Fucking disgusting. Now get her <laughs> out of here. Put her, put her back in the cage until we need to fight another hot suspect. <laughs> yeah. She can't hear us. She's listening to fish. <laughs> <laughs> But that's it. Yeah, they're like, see, we brought her in as a prop. Now take her away. We're done with her for now. And you think that that's that's that. But no, that is the opening to a whole fucking, I don't know, a a scared straight tour that Captain Hayes has been working on. Yeah, he's got a whole zoo of former hotties. He's like, how about all of that? Gladys, look at Gladys. Gladys used to be really hot. Now look at her arm. (laughs) And apparently she's on heroin. And so she's been doing the injections thing. Um, She appears to have turned 
into a zombie from the wrist up. Yep. Um, and it's like, this is what happens when you take the needle. It's like, guys, uh, PSA, never share your needles with the undead. You can catch <laughs> yeah. the zombie virus by doing needles with the undead. <laughs> I really wanted Anne to be like, you guys know I do weed, right? I'm arrested for weed. Oh, shit. Oh, um, <laughs> fuck. All right, well, we're going to, we'll go introduce you to a prisoner down here. She ate a whole bag of Red Hots. She didn't... <laughs> So, they want to. <laughs> well, and in case seeing Gladys's arm looking like the guys who got radiation poisoning in HBO's Chernobyl wasn't <laughs> enough, they then take her to Gladys's old apartment and show her that it's very small and cramped. Right. Right. It takes a while seeing this how that's the best apartment like 50% of our audience can afford in the place they live. It took a minute for us to figure out that that's the point they were making. <laughs> yeah. I wanted Anne to take them to my house and have them be like, holy shit, what drugs was this guy on? <laughs> no, he just, <laughs> just got a toddler. <laughs> but the thing is, did they keep Gladys's house like preserved for just this kind of occasion? I tell you, yes, right. She's in jail. You would have thought they'd have rented that place the fuck out. Yeah. But instead, they're doing the universal tour, but for crackheads. I just wanted the person who lives there now to show up and be like, guys, can you stop using my apartment as a. I know it's a crappy apartment. I just, I, I'm, I'm dealing with it. Yeah. <laughs> But the fucking Universal Tour is not quite over yet. They then take her to the psycho ward where drug users inevitably wind up, right? Yeah. This is where we meet straight jacket lady. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote in my notes. I mean, to be fair, most of these ladies just, you know, wanted a divorce or something. Yeah, like, right. You know, we're right, pretending yeah. it's with some of them smoked weed, too. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Lots of other activities were involved with the insanity commitment in 1949. <laughs> And doesn't he say as well, and once you're here, you're as good as dead, essentially. Yes. Thought, or at least that's the message they're trying to give us, yeah. Right. And then right. to prove that, they go and take us to an actual dead person, which is so wildly inappropriate. They take us to the morgue, and it's like, you see, they pull back the cover, dead, put the cover back. And that you don't get to use dead bodies as like st scared straight props yeah. in this kind of way. This is wildly inappropriate. And keep in mind that they would have had to drive all the way across LA traffic to do this like she's like yes. no I know what you meant by dead right like yeah. I actually had a vision in my head of what you were talking about <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah and when he pulls back the dead girl he goes this one's lucky she killed herself and I wrote in my notes I mean I get it movie but not cool <laughs> oh, <Jesus. laughs> and I, I wanted to carry on doing that like traveling to do with something visual like this one's lucky like she's kicked the bucket and then we see them like drive to a hardware store where he buys a bucket you see bucket. this is a bucket <laughs> 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 We really don't have a lot going on right yeah, now. Yeah, right, we have right. 40, it's either this or go six, home and take a nap, actually. Take yeah. another nap. Yeah. It's like a little Italy pizza tour. We got a lot of stops and not a lot going We're on. We're never okay. going to find Marsha's car. Yeah, yeah, I've been through the Jive Dictionary three times now. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's this or do a Beatles tour of Liverpool. You have two <laughs> options. <laughs> So they go back to the office to wrap up their scared straight tour. Uh, she still doesn't want to help them, though. But the thing is, they get back to the, to the office and then he summarizes the trip. So like, it's weird that they waited to get back to the office before he summarized what she just seen. Like, what was the car journey like? Right. Was it just like an awkward silence? And if she tried to speak, he'd be like, uh, 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 no, no, wait for it. Wait, wait, no, <laughs> we're, we're off, I have, a, thing. Oh, I have like, a summary, but... Mm, LS traffic, am I right? Don't answer. Don't answer if I'm right enough <laughs> until we get back to the office. <laughs> okay, we can play one round of I'm thinking of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to keep the moment. And this is also where, we, where he says, you know, and it's been two weeks since your brother killed himself. Like, two weeks? This has been two weeks? So she, she has only slid into all of this in two weeks. Yes. This is insane. Like she suddenly like Lorraine Brocco from Goodfellas in the space <laughs> of a fortnight. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but she, yeah, she's not going to help him. So the lady cop comes to take her to prison. She goes to jail. The narrator cuts in and says she was sentenced to 60 days in, in jail for the weed. That, by the way, was Lila Leeds' actual sentence. That the, this oh. actor, she spent 60 days in jail for weed. Oh, and God, maybe it says something about my work life balance, but I would kill for a 60 day prison sentence right now. <laughs> Just, oh, eating ramen noodles. I just realized I'm thinking of Heath's life. Heath's yeah, no, life and a right. prison yeah. sentence yeah. are very similar in my mind. <laughs> but the thing is, 60 days, the criminal stakes that we're supposed to be so worried about in this film is at most a two-month sentence. This is yes. not Pablo Escobar level stuff that no. we're talking about here. Yeah, so, so but we get a little montage of her going to weed prison. She's not having fun at all. But then the narrator, upon realizing that, yeah, but I guess 60 days in jail is not really that 
bad. He's like, also, also, she still feels guilty about the dead brother. <laughs> right. The 60 days in jail isn't a thing. So they're like, also, she's undergoing terrible post-trauma at finding her dead brother. And I'm like, yeah, I'll go ahead and not find my suicided sibling then, <laughs> which seems to be her major problem right now. Right, really? Yeah. yeah, exactly. What this film proves is that prison is inhumane, not that drugs are bad. It's just prison. the prison needs reform, not the drug laws need re reform here. Right. Well, and I should also point out that Lila Leeds, the, the, the actor in this movie, was introduced to heroin while she was in prison and became a heroin addict. So, like, what went wrong in her life was going to fucking prison. Whoa. Yeah, right. But also in her defense, in the, in the character's defense, if all it's going to take to push your brother over the suicidal edge is seeing you smoke a fucking joint, it's on him. Like, it's, he needed more help than you could provide, right? Yeah, she, she was pushing against an open door on that one. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so she's she's like pacing her way through her 60 day sentence and she starts to hear these voices in the background going, kid killer, kid killer, kid killer. We listen to that for two and a half goddamn minutes. It's yeah. different actors and they're all really trying to make it stay. kid killer, kid killer of kids. Kid, kid, there was a kid and then you killed him. Yeah. Middle kid. God, I wish we could swear in movies. It would be so much more effect. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh. it's Orson Welles trying to put the stress on the wrong part of the sentence in that advert. That's what it's kid killer. <laughs> T tell me how you can stress kid killer. You can't stress the la in kid. Show me. Show me how it's done. You show, show me, me how it's done. I'll go down on you. <laughs> Also, when she sees the different actors doing it, they're all like faces floating up in front and it just seems like they're doing like a rendition of Bohemian Rhapsody. Right, yes, kid killer yes. instead. Kid killer, kid killer, kid killer, kid killer, kid killer, <laughs> killer, killer, kid. With the, the mop bucket calls her a kid killer. The faucet calls her a kid killer. She looks at herself in the mirror while she slowly turns into weird Barbie. Yeah, yes. And, well, and then, and, and finally turns into her brother. And then, of course, she screams quite screamily again. Just one thing on the mop bucket. She's like cranking the, the handle on like a thing to squeeze out the rag mm -hmm. in the mop. And every time she cranks it, it says kid killer. <laughs> like she's got like a crank operated kid killer machine. Yeah, we shouldn't have given you that one. Sorry, that one's that, that's for some... <laughs> Why don't you switch with Larry's bucket? <laughs> like she does it small. <laughs> right. And she, t she uses Larry's and it's like pedophile. And she's like, sorry, Larry. God damn. <laughs> you deserve to be here, Larry. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> and mostly she just seems annoyed that she's saying the same thing all the time. Like she's hearing the same thing all the time. Like she's she's irritated that one of her cellmates has bought a soundboard and now all her life is just kid killer and sad <laughs> trombones. <laughs> a soundboard, you say? No, 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 no. We took a vote as a company. <laughs> So that, but then, of course, we cut to the mental hospital where her weed psychosis has inevitably led her, right? Obviously. She has a full time stare at her sympathetically nurse, which is nice. God. You don't really get that kind of care these days. Oh, medical care in this country. <laughs> Just where is the deep eye contact that we used to have in days gone by? <laughs> <laughs> But the, but the nurse has some words of wisdom because she's like, are you sure no one ever came to see me, nurse? And the nurse is like, let me, you know, let me give you some words of wisdom that I've learned in all of my years as a woman. I don't know who he is, but he's shit. He's just shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she's like, listen, the prison recidivism rate is really bad. And she's like, yeah, but it's. Is that because the bail system punishes people for being poor? And she's like, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But it's great as well because she says, you know, at first it's 60 days and then it's like 120 days. Before you know it, it's six months in, six months out. And when you add that up, that's half a lifetime. It's like, well, that can't add up to half a lifetime unless you start doing it as a baby. Right, no, as a you've baby. You've got to be doing that from the baby. baby. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now I want the scene of a six-month-old in prison, like mopping the floors while people are yelling kid killer at him. But they mean <laughs> he's a, a kid who is a killer. That book right, is, right. is dual use. It's useful in multiple <laughs> different types of crimes. No, just have him do it backwards. Then it says kill a kid and it works for him. There yes. you go. It's working, right, right, it's working out. <laughs> Are you part of the tour? I'm part of the tour. I don't know if you know. I'm, I'm stop 36 on the tour. <laughs> After they do the place where they make your own mozzarella. So then, so of course, then so Anne starts to like flash. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Go on. <laughs> It's just such a useless, stupid check up. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes like the four people who have gone on one tour, it's so bad. <laughs> <sighs> so, but of course, eventually, Anne 
starts flashing back to people talking to her early in the movie, which is the fat lady singing of GAM, right? So we have mm-hmm. permission right. to yeah. stop at any time. <laughs> but eventually she gets out of prison. She gets out of prison 10 days early, right? And and they say, like, what are you going to do when you get out of prison? She's like, well, I'm a lady, so I'm going to get my hair done first, most importantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, then her second priority is to get a bath to wash the prison off her. And I feel like you you take the bath before you have people working up close to your body. But yeah. And, and I also feel like you don't take the bath immediately you have to have paid a lot of money to have your hair and makeup done. You don't then immediately get into the bath. Exactly. Priorities are wrong. Right. No, she definitely has the, the wrong order there. She had two months to think this through and did not think this through. <laughs> So send it back. Yeah, right. <laughs> but then so we see her. I guess she's coming out of the beauty salon now or whatever. But Marky's picking her up and he's like, hey, I really appreciate you not turning me in. She's like, hey, well, not yet. And he goes, what? And she says, nothing, nothing. <laughs> By the way, it, came, it took me so fucking long to think of a non innuendo way of saying not turning her in. Right. Because I, I, I kept going like. Not fingering him. No, that doesn't. Not rolling over on him. No, that doesn't work. He yeah, doesn't. that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but she's been prison hardened. That's the key, right? 50 days in the slammer will do that to you. So she's not taking any shit off of Marky anymore. She says, in fact, I actually know bigger and more important drug dealers than you. And now he's intrigued, right? Yeah, she somehow made some connections with dealers from out east. Again, it's been less than three months since her first joint. <laughs> and now she's Walter White. It's, it's right. ludicrous. Yeah. So, but she explains to Marky that there's a new big crime syndicate moving into town. But luckily, if, she, if he wants, she can get him a meeting with the new big boss. Right? There are, I should point out, 12 minutes left in this movie when we start introducing all this shit. Yes. And she said it was like because she had a roommate who was a gangster's mall, which, you know, we know she didn't have a roommate. So I, so I wrote, is she playing him? Because if so, the lesson here is that drugs make you smart and cool. Yes. Because she was like this naive innocent before. And now she's like able to like scam a drug dealer but just purely because she'd done drugs and been to prison. And and got, and get her revenge and everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that is the message of the film. Spoiler it alert. <laughs> so, yeah. So now we get Anne. She's in Mr. Trainer's office with Marky and Gabriel, the crime boss. This is cop number one who was practicing his jive talk earlier. That's yeah. right. And, and this scene opens with Trainer saying, I don't usually talk business at this late hour. And I was like, yeah, this is a real four suits kind of day. It's, it's one of those days. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have so, to put on my first suit again. All right, all right. I've cycled all the way through now. But Trainer realizes that Gabriel works for Mr. Romero. Yes, the Mr. Romero and gets all fanboy about it, right? <laughs> he hands him a stack of money. He says, I've got $75,000 for you and hands him a stack of way less than 750 bills. Yeah, it could not be 700, 750 grand there. There's no way in the world that, that that's 750 bills. But the thing is, 75 grand in 1949, I looked this up, I did the, the actual kind of inflation conversion. That's $962,000 in today's Jesus money Christ. that this guy was carrying as a single wad of bills. Just under right. a mill. He's just got a bunch of, bunch of $1,000 bills in a pile there. <laughs> well, and also keep in mind that earlier they were negotiating the price and he mentioned that he was paying $25 a can. So that leads us to believe that he's going to pick up 3,000 cans of tomato <laughs> joints yes. in his personal vehicle. <laughs> right. But just then trainer gets a phone call. Once again, I guess his shipment got ripped off, right? Because he's like, oh, there's no stuff down in our warehouse. We're going to have to pick up more. Yeah, it's the cursed phone of plot. Guys, be honest with me. Am I a bad drug lord? I feel like I'm a bad drug lord. It's like the second thing I've lost in two months. He just needs to change phone. Every time this phone rings during a business deal, he's being robbed. Just get a different, just stop answering the phone. That's the only (laughs) solution to this. Don't answer the phone. It's all going to be fine. So Anne and Marky Lee, they've got to go out to Arizona to pick up more, well, 3,000 cans of tomato joints, I guess, right? Yeah. And we see that the cops are still tailing them. And what has become of this anti-drugs propaganda movie? It's now become like a noir crime caper while she, she's gone full femme fatale. It's like, uh-huh. yeah, say, like full, full on kind of that, uh, that, that voice. It's, this movie did not know where it was going at this point, I don't think. I like it because it's very obvious that their PSA got boring to them and they were like, we could do like 
one or two action scenes, right? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, the whole thing doesn't have to be a PSA. No, it's like the third act hasn't met the first two. Yeah. It's <laughs> fucking nuts. We did a piano concert. We can do a fist fight. Come on. <laughs> you guys are being lame. You wouldn't even let me show someone smoking a joint on TV. So, yeah. So, and there's also this great bit where she starts going like, wow, Marky, you still haven't got promoted up the line to like regional district manager of marijuana sales for this area. <laughs> Very disappointing. I thought you were more ambitious than that, right? You're really getting in his head. Yeah, assistant to the regional drug dealer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Marky's just like, yeah, you know, you got to buy all of it on Telegram now. And everyone's always like, get verified. And was, I, I don't always want to do drugs so I can convince someone in fucking Arizona. To <laughs> anyway, you know, never mind. It's fine. You send me a picture of your driver's license. It's weird. <laughs> so, so meanwhile, Gabriel slash the undercover cop, he gets the drop on Raymond the henchman. Right. And then he explains the whole sting operation to Raymond, who is the bad guy in what is like a reverse James Bond villain move. I've right. never seen this before where the good guy explains their plan to the bad guy before the plan's done. Yes. But then... Right before, this is a very short scene, but I do want to point this out. Right before the scene end, he goes, don't worry. They put on plays where you're going. Do they <laughs> put on plays in jail? I wanna, is that the reference? I kind of want to watch a jail play now. I right? absolutely <laughs> want to watch a jail play. <laughs> Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? <laughs> and then, so we get some shots of... Anne and Marky driving through Arizona and everything. And there's this little ticker that I guess is the cops telling the boss what they're doing. But it's also just the movie very lazily explaining what has to happen at this point, right? It, it does. But that ticker moves so slowly that you have to read it as it goes along that it's it's too slow for you to read towards the end and then remember what the first words right, on the ticker yes. were because it's going so slow. Yes, I was I was going to say ticker technology has come really far <laughs> since this movie. <laughs> so yeah, but the cops like followed them all the way to the supplier and so now they know where the supplier is and they know that all you have to do is ask for a new tire and gas or whatever, and they give you weed, which is weird. They give you 3,000 cans of tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now, okay, so we cut to Trainer. He's at the warehouse, and he's going to show it to Gabriel, the undercover cop. Right? They get in there. Now, there's a note from Raymond, because, of course, Gabriel is, has got, you know, like, already got to Raymond. There's a note that says, went to eat, be right back, or whatever. And he's like, oh, my henchman's not here. I'm sure he'll be back later. Oh, this is awkward. So, um... How did you guys meet? Not a, lot of, not a lot of couples in drug dealing. Oh, at a party. That's fun. That's fun. Who was playing piano? I read in the paper your brother killed himself. Was that sad? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. So, yeah, this is where Ann and Marky show up. And just then the pay phone gets a phone call. Trainer cannot have a meeting without taking a phone call in the middle of it. No, right? absolutely not. <laughs> we, we know the type. We've all met this guy. It's another phone call of plot. Yeah, com constantly. Sits down on the toilet, gets a phone call. God damn it, someone stole my shit out of my ass. <laughs> and the thing is, this is, this is Romero calling to, yes. like, to give him... So like Romero, the, the, famous drug the, the famous drug supplier, is called at a very convenient time, which is like, these two drugs guys would have to beautifully choreograph this to the exact second. And I wanted us to see them like planning this out. Okay, so I think, I think it's, yeah, it's going to take me like, it's best to say six or seven minutes. I know that red light is sometimes you have to go through <laughs> two or three cycles to get through it. Right, he couldn't have texted him and say, call now. It's 1949. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. They had to time this, which means like if they had shown up earlier, trainer would have had to like make small talk for a little bit or something. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, but yes, that's Mr. Romero calling to say he doesn't know no Mr. Gabriel. That guy's an undercover cop. So, Marky smacks Anne because he realizes, you know, like that she set him up, and the cop smacks Trainer. And then we have a great big 1949 fight scene. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is, unfortunately, they would not discover the left hook until I think 1973, right? <laughs> so, yeah, we only yeah, get yeah, no, true. In this one. Muhammad Ali actually invented it. We don't talk about it a lot, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and of course, you can't tell which besuited white guy is which during this no. entire thing. Yeah, it's, first of all, they're identical. Second mm -hmm. of all, it's shot in the fucking dark. Mm -hmm. Right. There's yeah. no way of knowing what's going on. No, and they keep moving to the darkest portions of the set, right? Because the set is lit for like close up and they keep moving way back. 
Yeah, and at least in cowboy films, they put like a white hat on the good guy and a black hat on the bad guy so you could tell which is which. They don't even do that here. No, one of these guys could just not be wearing a fucking sports coat during the drug deal, (laughs) but no. I, I don't think that would make it past the Hayes Code. I think that's another thing you can't show. Man, not what, in am I a court. prostitute? Yeah. <laughs> I don't take off this sports coat until it's time for my third or fourth suit of the day. I'll yeah, right, out. right, yeah. <laughs> I will say, though, after this shit fight for like two minutes, the Pratt fall off the stairs onto the table was incredible. Yeah, that was good. That was that good. Was a- I think that was real. I think that guy just fell. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, good, let's keep it. Yeah, back then they just kill an actor here and there. That would explain why the cop did like a little jog around his prone body to see if he was all right. Because it was like, he he burst into like a very slight jog. Yeah, I know you're right. As he did that. So yeah, it might have been real. He absolutely did. But yeah, but the good guys win the day. Marky and Trainer get arrested. And then we head back to Hayes' office where they can thank Anne for being a narc, right? Well, actually, it's so that she can thank the cops for scaring her straight before she ended up a suicidal psychopath in the psycho ward, right? Yeah, yeah, because they they open with like, thanks for all your help. And by all her help, they mean doing all of the police work, while two thirds of the on-screen police had no involvement at all. Only one cop was there during any of the police work. So two of the three police officers did absolutely nothing. And Anne, the ingenue, cracked the entire case. Right. And put her life on the line for it. Yeah. I wanted the cop to bust in and be like, guys, my jive talk is red. Oh, motherfucker. <laughs> but here's the weirdest choice they make. They're like, thanks for your, your help. She turns to deliver her, I really learned something today monologue. Yes. Yep. But because it's 1949, the fucking scrolling credits are like, you don't need to hear a woman talk. Here's the thing about yes. marijuana. <laughs> yep. Yeah, the, the fucking title cards come up and give what I have to assume is the dial, the, the, the monologue that she's saying silently behind them. Yeah. That's so fucking weird. <laughs> and and we, we slowly pan in on her face as well. Yeah. While she's still saying this. The only thing I can think is her accent has been developing throughout this movie. And I can only think by this last stage, it had, it had evolved to its final form and was incomprehensible. Oh. Oh, okay. oh, no, we, right. we can't have that. We yeah, can't have that. that. We've got to... Or maybe... I mean, this is the 40s. It could have just been something incredibly problematic. That's true. Like, yeah, she mm, could look, Even could... the Hayes Court isn't going to let this through. No, they would never block that out, though. No, They'd be they like, wouldn't. yes, they that wouldn't. is a good moral to learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... The, yeah, the, but we get her whole, like, monologue and title cards. There's so many title cards. I started copying them all out, and then I realized there was way too many to copy out, but I kept... I, like, I already started, so I had to. So I copied them all into my fucking notes. There, there's one part that I love where it says, best authorities estimate that the world has over 200 million dope addicts today. <laughs> yes. Yep, that, is, yeah. that would be 8% of the world's population <laughs> in 1949. <laughs> uh, for those keeping track. And... 75% of all new marijuana smokers are teen dash ages. So the word teenager had not been invented at that point. Well, mm-hmm. apostrophe teen, right? Apostrophe teen <laughs> oh, yes, hyphen age. Teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you got to say it as you're playing a banjo. <laughs> teenagers. <laughs> But I think we can we can probably then do the math to try and figure out how, what percentage of the world's population would have been teenagers and whether these numbers right, actually... Right, yeah, exactly. I don't right. think they do. I don't think they come together. <laughs> so, but, but the point is, it's like, tomorrow it could be your youngster. And then it says, and this seems like a direct challenge to me, it said, no one seeing this film could be easily tempted to so wreck their mind and body. So I packed a bowl... <laughs> <laughs> show you. And then the last line of the scroll is, cooperate fully with government authorities, yes! which is just an incredible line to end on. <laughs> Snitches get badges. Yeah, the, <laughs> the parentheses on this movie are essentially, how about them narcs, huh? So, <laughs> all right, well, I, I'm clearly doing the work of several dope addicts at this point based on those numbers, so I guess we need to wrap things up there, but Marsh, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. It's been a ton of fun. Uh, I would not have missed it for the world. I would not have missed it. And a quick reminder that the show notes have links where you can find many of Marsh's other fine contributions to skepticism and rationality. And while that's going to do it for our review of Wild Weed, that's not going to do it for our episode just yet because we still need to lure ourselves back into this trap next week. So Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, I don't know about you gentlemen, but I'm longing for the supernatural after all this hard hitting realism. Mm -hmm. Marsh, feel like coming back next week, but somehow sounding a month older. (laughs) (laughs) All right. 
Well, then we will be watching the Happy Science Cults oh. Rebirth of Buddha. Oh, I'm so nice. excited to revisit the Happy Science <laughs> Cult. All right. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 420 to a merciful close. That's right. That was the reason we did a weed movie, Marsh. Uh, once again, a huge thanks to Marsh for all his help, but perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation to patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Aid, The Citation Needed, D&D Minus, and The Skeptocrat, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Tim Robinson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnik of Drafts on Mars. All the other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm the Lucius, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with a Breakfast Club close. Marky got out of prison three days before weed became legal in his state. <laughs> weed went on to win the war on drugs. <laughs> this movie came out in 1949, just two years after a 17-year-old Noah Lugans okay. smoked his first joint. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Noah, I turned 40 next week. This is my last chance to make fun. No, it's oh. just three weeks ago that you turned 40. In this, that is true. This sorry. Yes, that's yes. right. Fucking dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Apologize to past you. <laughs> You're probably dead by now, though. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay, I've read the uh, skits ahead of time, and I'm glad I have. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get surprised crap. by this one. <laughs> <clears throat> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved.